black men thinking, thinking. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. Black men thinking. Anytime you throw your weight behind a political party that controls two-thirds of the government and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. Black men thinking. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. Black men thinking, thinking, thinking. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Black men thinking. Stanley Levy, thinking, Black Man Thinking, here thinking. on the Dominant Force Internet Conservatism. Talk America Radio. US. Also, WDBQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5, North Florida Talk Radio, Freedom in America Radio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Getting started here, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. There seems to be no small amount of debate about that in recent days because this past Wednesday, President Trump made this announcement. But today we finally acknowledge the obvious, that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. This is nothing more or less than a recognition of reality. It is also the right thing to do. It's something that has to be done. That is why, consistent with the Jerusalem Embassy Act, I am also directing the State Department to begin preparation to move the American Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This will immediately begin the process of hiring architects, engineers, and planners so that a new embassy, when completed, will be a magnificent tribute to peace. In making these announcements, I also want to make one point very clear. This decision is not intended in any way to reflect a departure from our strong commitment to facilitate a lasting peace agreement. We want an agreement that is a great deal for the Israelis and a great deal for the Palestinians. We are not taking a position of any final status issues, including the specific boundaries of the Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem or the resolution of contested borders. Those questions are up to the parties involved. The United States remains deeply committed to helping facilitate a peace agreement that is acceptable to both sides. I intend to do everything in my power to help forge such an agreement. Without question, Jerusalem is one of the most sensitive issues in those talks. The United States would support a two-state solution if agreed to by both sides. In the meantime, I call on all parties to maintain the status quo at Jerusalem's holy sites, including the Temple Mount, also known as Haram al-Sharif. Above all, our greatest hope is for peace, the universal yearning in every human soul. I'm hard-pressed to find anything other than Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and Israel will decide what they're going to do with it with regard to peace process with the Palestinians and other Arabs and everyone else who also lives there. But it is their capital. That's pretty much what he's saying. We're not taking a side as to who should have what, 
we're saying it's Israel's and they're going to do what they think is in their best interest. If they want to divide it up, give it up. That's up to them. But Jerusalem is, as he said, let's acknowledge the obvious. Jerusalem is Israel's capital. It is the city where God placed his name and gave to his people. Granted, he also drove them out for their disobedience. Nobody's arguing that. But in 1948, against all odds, he brought them back and they are a nation again. I know the discussion. These aren't the same Israelites. No, if you spend 2,000 years being persecuted after having been dread out, driven out of your land and having to intermarry and weaken your bloodline and everything else, you wouldn't be the same folks coming back to your homeland that left either. We get that. But they are still God's people. It is still his deed to them that determines who has the land and he has not revoked that deed and they are now in the land. They're also the capital of Israel, Jerusalem is, with regard to war. 1967, because between 1948 and 1967, uh, 1948 being the year of the new nation or state of Israel being formed, in 1967, despite pleas from Israel that Jordan remained neutral during the Six-Day War, Jordan, which had concluded a defense agreement with Egypt on May 30th of 1967, attacked West Jerusalem, which was held by Israel on the war's second day. On June 27th, three weeks after the war ended, because you do remember that Israel wins all wars against Arabs. They're undefeated since 1948. Israel has never lost. And they've always been outnumbered. And they've always been surrounded. And they have never lost. Three weeks after the war ended in the reunification of Ju Jerusalem, Israel extended its law and uh, jurisdiction to East Jerusalem, including the city's Christian and Muslim holy sites. It's been one city since 1967. They took Jerusalem. They had West Jerusalem. They took East Jerusalem. It's their capital. They won it outright. There is also the matter of U.S. law. There was, and it's still on the books, it has not been repealed, the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995. Now who would that mean? Bill Clinton must have dealt with that. Here are the findings of that law. Each sovereign nation under international law and custom may designate its own capital. Since 1950, the city of Jerusalem has been the capital of the state of Israel. Three, the city of Jerusalem is the seat of Israel's president, parliament, and supreme court, and the site of numerous government ministries and social and cultural institutions. Four, the city of Jerusalem is the spiritual center of Judaism and is also considered a holy city by the members of other religious faiths. From 1948 to 1967, Jerusalem was a divided city, and Israeli citizens of all faiths as well as Jewish citizens of all states were denied access to holy sites in the area controlled by Jordan. In 67, the city of Jerusalem was reunited during the conflict known as the Six-Day War. Since 1967, this is Congress coming up with this, guys. Jerusalem has been a united city administered by Israel, and persons of all religious faiths have been guaranteed full access to holy sites within the city. Stop. When the city was divided, Jordan and other Arabs said, you can't come in here and visit holy sites. Since 1967, when Israel took over the entire city, they have opened up access to holy sites to everyone. Oh, there's more. In 1990, the Congress un un unanimously adopted Senate Concurrent Resolution 106, which declares that the Congress strongly believes that Jerusalem must main an undivided city in which the rights of every ethnic and religious group are protected, which is exactly what it is today. Under the timetable in item A3, the United States Embassy in Israel should be established in Jerusalem not later than May of 1999. 
bottom line, Donald Trump is following the law. The law of the United States says that the embassy should be in Jerusalem and that it should have been there 18 years ago. Yes, presidents have had the option, if you want to call it that, to delay that if they thought there was some threat to national security interests. But Donald Trump followed the law. Something his predecessor did not do, Barack Obama was famous for ignoring the law, and obviously not something that Bill Clinton did, because 1999 occurred during his presidency and he did not move the embassy. It did not happen under George W. Bush. He did not move the embassy. And we know, of course, it was never going to happen under Barack Hussein Obama, despite his campaign support of Israel. So what about the reaction to all this? Because it is interesting. In the UN, you had a predictable reaction. An animated discussion between the U.S. ambassador and the Palestinian representative just one of the urgent conversations taking place around the room even before the session began. The packed chamber testament to the depth of international concern, and some argue the credibility of the Security Council itself is under attack. If the Council do, does not uh, act accordingly to what its mandate is, which is preserving peace and security, then uh, the Council might become another occupied territory. Speaking by video link from Jerusalem, the UN special coordinator condemned the unilateral U.S. action. If the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not resolved in line with relevant UN resolutions and in a manner that meets the legitimate national aspirations of both peoples, it risks being engulfed into the vortex of religious radicalism that has taken over the Middle East. Italy's position on Jerusalem remains unchanged. Speaker after speaker reaffirmed the UN's position on the status of Jerusalem. And we believe that the future status, as I said, of Jerusalem can only be resolved through negotiations. Criticism, too, from the staunchest of US allies, and the British ambassador also called on President Trump to make good his professed commitment to a peace process. We welcome his commitment to a two-state solution. The US representative decided the best form of defense is attack. Over many years, the United Nations has outrageously been of the world's foremost centers of hostility towards Israel. The UN has done much more damage to the prospects for Middle East peace than to advance them. Of the 19 nations represented in the chamber on this day, the U.S. position was shared only by Israel. The United States had the courage and true understanding of justice to officially state what has always been known. The U.S. decision to reward Israelis' impunity undermines and essentially disqualifies its leadership role to seek peace in the region. While the Jordanian ambassador exchanges high fives with the Palestinian representative, a key question remains hanging in the chamber. How can the U.S. continue to be regarded as an honest broker in attempting to resuscitate a long, dormant negotiation process? Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, United Nations. What peace process? There wasn't any peace going on during Barack Obama. So we had eight years of nothing. So it is dormant. But at the same time, if anyone wanted peace in the region, and by I say anyone, I'm talking about the Palestinians and Arabs. Because despite their plot, their, their calls and pleas for Israel, Israel's not letting us have peace, Israel, Israel's building, they're still firing rockets into Israel every day. They say they want peace, but they are actively going out and killing or trying to kill Israeli citizens every day and then saying that it's Israel that does not want peace. Fascinating. Fascinating. ABC News looked at reactions about this in this way. New fallout from President Trump's move to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and ultimately move the U.S. Embassy there. The president called the dramatic break from the past a step toward peace, but it is drawing a fierce reaction in the region and condemnation from a chorus of world leaders. Our chief global affairs anchor Martha Reddison in Washington with all the latest. Good morning, Martha. 
Good morning, George. Outside of Israeli support, there has been condemnation of President Trump's move across the globe, from the Arab world to European leaders who've called it regrettable, unhelpful. And Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas said the announcement could lead to wars that never end and shows that the U.S. can no longer be an honest broker in the peace process. And on the West Bank, you see there, there have been protests this morning with Israeli police firing tear gas into a crowd. But so far, the protests have been relatively small. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson in Vienna this morning is calling the president's move just a recognition of reality since Israel has most of its government offices in Jerusalem, George. Yeah, and one of the questions, will the protests escalate tomorrow? And at the heart of this are competing claims over the status of Jerusalem and what this means for the peace process. Exactly. It's been assumed that if a two-state solution was ever agreed upon, East Jerusalem, which is majority Arab, would be the Palestinian capital and West would be for the Israelis. But President Trump's announcement changes that, putting the U.S. clearly on the side of the Israelis, claiming it all, George. Notice that no one in that report really acknowledged that U.S. law indicates that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and they also come up with this well it's always been understood that East Jerusalem would go to really so you want the Israelis to give up at a negotiating table what they acquired by blood in 1967 that's what you want because you think that's going to be peaceful you actually think that them giving back what they want in war is going to stop Hamas from launching rockets into nothing's going to stop these people except but we don't want to go there and it's Israel's problem and if Israel can handle it then it shouldn't be too much weight for you now Al Jazeera which has actually become one of my favored uh, news organizations went into the area in and around Jerusalem and asked the people who lived there what they thought. The reaction, of course, was pretty predictable. For Palestinians living in occupied East Jerusalem, the sudden arrival of winter on Wednesday matched the news that the U.S. president was set to recognize the city as Israel's capital. This is an insane move that will inflame the whole region because he's attacking all of our values, our sacred places, and our humanity. Jerusalem, according to UN resolutions, is the capital of two states. If he does this today, he will destroy the peace process that America is sponsoring. While some of his colleagues have been publicly welcoming the move, Israel's prime minister steered clear of the topic during a speech to foreign diplomats in Jerusalem, making only this oblique reference in a video for his Facebook page as he drove away. Our historical national identity is receiving important expressions every day, but particularly today. Wow, that's beautiful. Moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv was a campaign promise to important Trump financial donors, such as Las Vegas casino magnate Sheldon Adelson, as well as Trump's core right-wing evangelical base. President Trump needs them more than ever as his popularity ratings plummet. Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel, and it must remain undivided. Trump is certainly not the first to make such promises on the campaign trail, but he will be the first to translate them into potentially hugely consequential action. Before his speech, Trump briefed Arab leaders, which led to this question at the State Department briefing. If, I'm wondering if you can say that, that, that he's gotten the support of anyone for any decision that he might make. So, I, again, I'm not going to characterize those conversations. Minutes later, the White House press secretary was similarly coy about the decision. Uh, no, again, he spoke with five leaders. That's hardly um, indicative of uh, everybody across the globe. The Israeli mayor of Jerusalem said the embassy move could take two minutes by switching the sign on the current U.S. consulate in West Jerusalem. White House staff, who didn't want to be named, later said that was not going to happen. Building a new embassy would take at least three to four years. They also said that President Trump was simply affirming what they called reality, both historical and modern, that connected the state of Israel to the city. They argued issues of sovereignty would not change and said that not moving the embassy 22 years after it was required by Congress in 1995 hadn't made any difference to the peace process. The Trump administration remains committed to a two-state solution, they said, if that's what both parties wanted. If that's what both parties want. Acknowledging the law. Acknowledging the fact that, the, that okay, we didn't move it because we didn't want to inflame tensions. What did that do for peace? 
there's no movement toward peace. That didn't get the Arabs to stop launching attacks, building tunnels and everything else to try to undermine Israel. Didn't happen. And then, of course, there's the Democrat in the United States reaction. A New York Post uh, editorial on the 6th of December. Democratic naysayers on Trump's Jerusalem move are outright hypocrites. Most of the reaction to Trump's historic recognition of Israel's capital was predictable. Of course, the UN hates Israel. Europe hates Israel. Everybody hates Israel, except us, and maybe some other people every once in a while. But that's because many of those now bashing the move, which includes relocating the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, well, the folks who were bashing it now enthusiastically supported it when they felt sure it wouldn't actually happen. Such self-professed friends of Israel as Senator Dianne Feinstein of California, Richard Brumenthal of Connecticut, and Dick Durbin of Illinois all criticized Trump's de decision. Yet Feinstein and Durbin in 1995 voted for the Embassy Relocation Act, which mandates the capital right, that, um, that Jerusalem be home to the U.S. Embassy. And that it is an undivided capital. If you heard that voice ba basically saying that Jerusalem is Israel's capital it was undivided, that was none other than Barack Hussein Obama who failed to move the embassy. But let me tell you what this is really about. This is about leadership. This is about commitment to principle. The United States is the ally unwavering of Israel, has been since its founding in 1948. There have been times where it seemed weak. The last eight years under Barack Obama seemed among the weakest. Donald Trump is not Barack Obama. He's better than that as far as being a friend of Israel. And that is what the United States is, friends of Israel. It's not like, oh, there might be terrorism. There was terrorism in 48 when it was formed. Menachem Begin was a terrorist in trying to get the state of Israel um, recognized. And Yasser Arafat and the PLO, come on, guys, really? Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Donald Trump recognized it. You got the same predictable bash la backlash from the same do-nothings who said you shouldn't do it. From the same do-nothings who kept the peace process stalled but have not done anything to cease the violence, the Arab violence against Israel. Israel deserves their capital. And I'm glad that the United States is following what is obvious, what is true, and what is lawful in allowing that to be the case. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, we'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force of Internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us. Also, WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5 North Florida Talk Radio, FreedomInAmericaRadio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Well, you may recall... Among the first actions that President Trump took upon uh, finishing his inauguration was to sign an order, an executive order, banning travel into the United States from certain countries. And the progressives on the court, who have been placed there by Barack Obama and others, went into a tizzy and they blocked it. And he did a second one, and they blocked it. Now, they had no legal standing. To go so far as to say they did not, ban, they did not block his travel bans based on the text of the bans. They actually went so far as to block his travel bans based on the campaign statements that he made as though those had anything to do with what the order stated. They also overlooked the fact that the order 
block travel from the same countries that was that were um, had restricted issues in a 2015 law signed by Barack Obama. And they missed the fact that, well, it's a Muslim ban. He didn't ban travel from all Muslim countries. He didn't ban all Muslims. He picked out certain countries. And the reason for that is they did not really have functioning governments or they were hostile to the United States. He didn't ban travel from Saudi Arabia. He didn't ban travel from Dubai. He didn't ban travel from Qatar. He didn't ban travel from a lot of places. He banned travel from places that were that did not really have functioning governments or that were openly hostile to the United States. Well, two progressive judge rulings and hearings and everything else and appeals, we finally got up to the Supreme Court. And on this past Monday, according to the New York Times, their article came out, Supreme Court allows Trump travel ban to take effect. The Supreme Court allowed the third version of the Trump administration's travel ban to go into effect while legal challenges against it continue. The decision was a victory for the administration after its mixed success before the court over the summer when justices considered and eventually dismissed disputes over the second version. The court's brief unsigned orders on Monday urged appeals courts to move swiftly to determine whether the latest ban was lawful. Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor, to to be honest, the two justices who are least qualified at this point to render decisions on anything, said they would have denied the administration's request to allow the latest ban to go into effect. Oh, by the way, the decision on this was not 5-4. The decision on this was 7-2. 7-2. Now, CBS News had something to say about this uh, on the day it was there. This is CBS, I believe, in New York uh, giving a report on the travel ban. They actually sent somebody out to uh, an airport to do some of their reporting. Third version of the controversial travel ban can be enacted despite legal challenges. Now citizens from six Muslim majority countries, Chad, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, as well as Venezuela and North Korea, are banned from entering the U.S. We spoke to travelers at JFK Airport to get their take. Is it discriminatory to a certain degree? Yes, it is discriminatory. It, it really it is. There are a few exceptions to the travel ban. Students from Iran are allowed an education visa. All visitors from Syria. Syria and North Korea, countries named as state sponsors of terrorism are banned. Somalian nationals can receive a visa with extra security screening. They must look into it and uh, give the innocent, innocent people the chance to come over here. Monday's ruling is a victory for President Trump after lower courts blocked the first two versions of the ban from taking effect. Attorney General Jeff Sessions is praising the Supreme Court's decision, saying, quote, the Constitution gives the president the responsibility and power to protect this country from all threats, foreign and domestic and this order remains vital to accomplishing those goals. Those who already have visas or green cards will not be impacted by this ruling but those applying for them may be denied access to the United States altogether or face a much stricter security screening. Let's be clear about something. The President of the United States has the constitutional authority to control who comes into this country by law and by executive action. He has that authority. The Constitution gives him that authority. The idea that this was a discriminatory ban, against whom was he? He's discriminating against Muslims. Really? So how many Muslims have been banned who are trying to come here from any of the other countries that we're talking about? How many? None? Oh, Oh, this doesn't even affect them? This is limited to certain countries? 
Well, the six of them are majority Muslim. You think there are only six Muslim countries on the planet? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Now, don't get me wrong. If that's what you believe, that's what you believe. You're wrong. But you might actually believe that. Now, a more in-depth analysis, if you will, was given by Judge Andrew Napolitano when he made an appearance on Fox Business News. Now, the Supreme Court justices issuing orders letting the so-called travel ban from six nations deemed as terror threats to be enforced in its entirety while the case is being litigated. Supreme Court justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor sided with the groups that opposed the revised presidential order. Here to break it all down, this breaking news is Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Anna Napolitano. So what does this all mean? All right, there's a long, tortuous history here, but, but reduced to its essence, this is the third of the president's executive orders on travel. This is the one that incorporates the Supreme Court mandated exceptions for relationships that are here. So a relationship means a relative by blood or marriage who's here that's expecting you, or a job or a university, uh, a student position offered to you in the United States. Those are huge exceptions that were not in the first executive order, were not in the sec second executive order, and the president himself deemed watered down, but he put it in the third order. The other side of this is it does establish for the president the right to point to countries and say all human beings from these countries will be subject to the extreme vetting because we believe these countries to uh, be more likely than not to produce those who are dangerous to our national security. So it's a partial win for the president and a partial win for those who thought the original order was a little bit uh, too strong. To make this even more complicated, this is just a preliminary ruling by the Supreme Court. This is not the final ruling that we're all waiting for on the constitutionality of the president's power to craft. When's that coming? I don't know when that's going to come. Coming. But, EMAC, the 7-2 to two vote today indicates how that other case is probably going to, going to turn out. The other case will establish definitively the power of the President of the United States to use the immigration exclusion provisions given him by the Congress to effectuate foreign policy and you keep know, the country We know safe. the politics of this. We reported here. Uh, I mean, President Obama was for this in the past when he was as a senator. Chuck Schumer is backed it. John Kerry has backed it at various points in time. What's, if, what's the implication of this? I mean, thousands of refugees are poised to come into the United States from these areas. Well, so the implication what's the implication? Is for people coming from those countries who have visas already, they get in using the ordinary vetting. For people coming from those countries who have relatives here waiting for them, a job here waiting for them, or an offer of a, a seat in a university, they get in through the regular vetting. But for people coming from those countries who are not in any other, of those three categories, visa, relatives, blood, or, or marriage, or job offer, they go through extreme vetting. It's not an absolute bar. It's extreme vetting, which gives great discretion to DHS to bar people. This is about national security. Yes. It's about terrorism. Yes, it's and also about the president's power mm -hmm. to conduct foreign policy unimpeded by the judiciary. Well, the, that's the, to the, my question. I mean, you had Cal courts in California, Maryland, and other places, Hawaii, trying to step in and stop the, this now, process, right? Let me tell right? you why Donald Trump should be happy. All of those decisions in Maryland, in Hawaii, in Washington State, that accused the president of making decisions based on race, all gone. Because gone. of this they ruling are, today. Correct. They are, are of historic value only. They are all gone. This is the ruling that controls. So then, uh, so is this embarrassing for the lower courts, this decision today? Uh, having been a lower court judge who was reversed many times, I can tell you, you get over it the next day when you, when you get your next case. So how do, what does the Supreme Court see that, a, that the pundits, the liberal pundits, did not? the strong history of Supreme Court recognition that on foreign policy the president is not equal to the other two branches of the government he is superior to them and on foreign policy we speak with one voice which is the president's voice and the congressional authorization to the president that he may uh, interfere with immigration in order to effectuate foreign policy Judge, you clear that up and you did it all in like less than three minutes thank you I was thinking what the heck's going on here but thank you Judge Always cleared it up so let's, let's recap, shall we? Donald Trump issued a travel ban within days of becoming president, having been inaugurated, and immediately some guy in Hawaii, and I think there might have been someone in Washington, or it may have been the second travel ban, uh, jumped up and said, this is, this is wrong, you can't do this. They couldn't cite any law. They, well, this could harm people. Um, 
No one who is not a U.S. citizen is entitled to access to the American homeland. I, I do hope we understand that much. Maybe we don't. Well, that was pushed. And instead of waiting around, Donald Trump and the administration decided to come out with a different travel ban, a little bit kinder, gentler, I guess you could say. That got blocked, too. And then finally goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court now has ruled. They did not rule five to four. This was not close. It was seven to two. Seven to two, which means seven uh, Supreme Court justices can still read the Constitution. And Ju- Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I have no idea what's keeping her uh, upright. They, they must have a some type of bar- uh, bariatric chamber in which she sleeps. Um, Donald Trump's already named one Supreme Court justice. And there's a reasonable probability that he would be able to name another one. Who? We'll see. If Donald Trump can win in the Supreme Court on matters like these, then he will win in the Supreme Court on other matters as well. Because what Donald Trump is doing is constitutional. It's that simple. Let's not forget that Donald Trump is also been given a an unprecedented opportunity to fill the federal bench with judges of his choosing, in part because the Democrats went nuclear and got rid of the filibuster rule. So now all it takes is a simple majority to get them in. And guess what? The Republicans still have a better than simple majority. Plus they have the vice president on 50-50 votes. So not only is this victory, while all those liberal judges are in place, impressive, what's more impressive is that Donald Trump has a chance to shape the federal bench for the next couple of generations. If that bothers you, and I know it does bother some people greatly, I'm actually quite happy about that because making America great really means stifling the voices of those who oppose the prerogatives of this president, not because they're his prerogatives. You forget Donald Trump Donald Trump was elected president because he shares the views of the American people. This is what they wanted, or they would have voted for Hillary Clinton. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, we'll be back right after Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the Dominant Internet Conservatism, Talk America Radio. That's also WDEQ, Talk Radio 2.1, Austin, Georgia, WJHC, Talk 107.5 in North Florida, Freedom in America Radio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Uh, as I've said often uh, on this program since the start, not that long ago, of the Trump administration, it is about the economy. And let's not forget that in the 10 months that Donald Trump has been president, the American economy has produced 2.2 million jobs. Unemployment is lower. Black unemployment is at its lowest level this century. Black home ownership has even started to tick back up after eight consecutive years of percentage decline under Barack Obama. Stock market is at record levels. The deficit is even being lowered as a percentage of GDP, although that doesn't impress me much. I want to see the numbers actually go down. Tax reform will probably help with that, but here's an interesting thing that is happening. GE, the company that had itself very much in bed with Barack Obama, is cutting jobs. Should we blame Alstom for this? I mean, GE bought their energy business in 2015, and it's gone south. 
Awesome is a big part of it. Uh, you know, it, it was not uh, the best timing for that deal. Um, the, the gas power market has really um, been struggling uh, lately. And uh, when they announced Alstom, that was in early 2014. It took over a year and a half for them to close that deal. And by that point, uh, you know, they added tens of thousands of new workers and, uh, and really expanded that business at, at just about the worst possible time. Is it a case that they just didn't transition enough? Is this another, you know, well, I, I don't want to say Kodak, but, you know, obviously, th there are some, maybe there's a string to be drawn between the two in the sense that we're headed towards a renewables world and GE is still in the old technology business. Yeah, you know, uh, they're dealing with this now. They actually do have a renewable energy oh, sure. business, and, um, and and so they're trying to um, build that up. And, and, and in fact, some of it uh, came from Alstom. So in, in that way, the deal actually will benefit them. But uh, it's not it's not necessarily a net uh, positive or even even neutral for GE if if they do transition to to renewables because uh, they don't have as strong a position in that market. They do have a, a good position in in wind energy, but they're they're not the undisputed number one the way they are in gas turbines. And then also the, uh, the, they can be less profitable because the aftermarket maintenance work isn't, uh, isn't necessarily as uh, lucrative as it is uh, for a gas turbine. Rick, GE, the worst performer on the Dow this year, but number one when it comes to cutting jobs. This will not sit well with President Trump. No, it, it, it probably won't. Uh, but, you know, I, I think uh, GE has um, uh, other concerns right now. Um, they're... Um, probably looking at Trump's tweets, and he hasn't said anything about them yet, but... Uh, um, I mean, they're saying that they're going to cut those jobs overseas, so that might help. That might help, um, and they haven't specified the exact breakdown, but, uh, um, but as, as I reported earlier, that most of the cuts are likely to come uh, outside the U.S., so, so that, that'll help, but uh, really they don't have much choice here. They need to cut costs. They need to cut costs. Wow. How does this happen? Because you might remember Jeffrey Immelt was in bed with Barack Obama all the way back to shovel-ready jobs. And he became, if I remember correct, the head of his jobs commission, the president's job co jobs commissions, encouraging the president to focus on jobs. And now GE is cutting jobs. Oh, by the way, this gentleman... Uh, was announced that he was going to no longer be CEO by the end of this calendar year. Well, we are also following another shakeup, this one at General Electric, where the company's chairman and CEO is stepping down. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Immelt uh, led the company for more than 15 years. He will be replaced by John Flannery, the current president and CEO of GE's healthcare business. The Yahoo Finance uh, columnist Rick Newman joins us now from the Yahoo Newsroom here in New York City to talk a little bit about this. Rick, how much did this shakeup come as a surprise to you? I guess uh, it might be a surprise that Jeff Immelt is leaving as soon as he is. Uh, but, um, you know, he's been there for 16 years. Um, and uh, there, there have been signs that uh, GE has been planning uh, sort of its succession strategy. And we should, it's worth pointing out, this is an orderly succession strategy that has been in the works now that it's public. We know that it's in the, been in the works for months. Uh, there were four candidates they were considering to replace him out. He will remain on the board um, until the end of this year for, you know, for some continuity and for in some transition. But, you know, this company has not performed well under Jeff Immelt. And uh, so for a company like GE, you might have expected he would stay longer. But, you know, in the world of, you know, give us give us results or else, it's, in a way, it's surprising he was there as long as he was. Yeah, that is actually pretty long. What about John Flannery? What do we know about him? He's going to be taking over. Yeah, he's been a very low-profile guy at GE. He's been there for a long time, and he's worked at a bunch of different divisions there, so he knows the entire company, um, and he's recently coming from, uh, the, from uh, running their health care unit, which is an important division for GE. I mean, healthcare is a growing business. They make medical equipment and things like that. Uh, they have invested heavily in that recently, so that tells you, um, you know, one of the things GE has done is they've gotten away from some of the basics uh, that, um, you know, that, that basically the, the way the company grew up, appliances, light bulbs and stuff, they don't really do that anymore. Um, healthcare is something important to them. Also different, you know, power stations, big industrial size uh, things like that. And he's, his job is going to be to help this company grow faster than it has under ML. Grow faster than it has under ML. Wow. CNN Money uh, put out an article on the 7th of December uh, talking about the job cuts, saying that they're going to be in the electrical power division, which makes the giant turbines and generators that 
the company estimates provides about one third of the electricity produced around the world. GE is by far the worst performing stock in the Dow Jones Industrial Average this year, down 44 percent. Let me let me make sure we understand this. While the stock market is hitting record highs, including the Dow, GE is down 44 percent. And as a result, the new CEO, John Flannery, who took over in August because that clip you just heard was a June announcement that Jeffrey Immelt was going to be out. And he's been trying to find a way to cut costs. The company says the job cuts will be mostly outside the U.S. I guess they're trying to avoid the tweet storm that comes uh, from not being a well-run company and going the opposite direction of the rest of the American economy. The Power Division's headcount will be reduced. It's 18,000. Wow. About 295,000 people worked for GE overall at the end of last year, 2016. But the company has cut jobs and costs throughout this year. It hopes to reduce costs by $1 billion next year. Are you hearing this? The interesting thing is when you look at a five-year chart of GE, they peaked right around July of last year. In July of last year, they came, they they closed uh, just under thirty-three dollars, and on the last Friday, well, excuse me, a few days ago on the sixth of December, they closed. At seventeen sixty six and on Friday was seventeen seventy one from thirty three dollars down to less than eighteen dollars and in between it was a very uneven climb upward from well quite frankly twenty dollars at the beginning of twenty thirteen all this while Jeffrey Emelt was serving as job czar for Barack Hussein Obama. Seems like he was unable to multitask. You need to run the company or do you need to sit there and chase the shovel-ready jobs that don't exist for a president who doesn't care about the American economy? And I already already understand it's coming. You can't say Barack Obama didn't care. I can say the results show the intent. The American economy under Barack Hussein Obama did not even grow at 3% per year in any year that he was president. And that's the first time that has ever occurred in American history. Not even during the Great Depression of the 1930s did the United States economy go eight years without at least a 3% annual growth rate in one of them and now I'm looking at a CEO who's run his company off a cliff well we got up to 33 and now it's down to under 18 the stock is worth less now than it was worth five years ago under your leadership and now you got somebody else coming in and people are getting ready to be hurt because they're going to cut costs and cut jobs because the company was poorly run. Well, you're just saying it's poor. I'm not the one who's saying it's poorly run. Listen to uh, Jim Cramer of CNBC and what he had to say about the way GE was run. I uh, actually confronted Jeff Immel with many of these particular issues in my last interview with him, and uh, he was very much in denial that these things would occur. I point that out because today's Flannery's dead. This is not a report going on Flannery. This is basically a statement which says, here's all the things that we've done wrong. I think they did some very ill-advised accounting in turbines. And don't forget, the key phrase here is that GE Capital might have to defer additional dividends. They gave $4.8 billion um, 
to, to regular GE until insurance reserve review is completed. I believe that the uh, it's possible that they have as much as 25 billion that they are unreserved on for long-term care that they kept on their books when they sold when they gave Genworth off on a spin. So he has to address that. David will, I think, will clear up a lot of the different issues. But the most important thing is this is the last of the email numbers. And the numbers going forward are going to look a lot like Honeywell's United Technologies. I, I, I don't want, look, sometimes in life you have to be harsh. And it's terrible. Sometimes in life you can't play for dinner. You have to say things you wouldn't like to say on TV. This is a disgrace what happened here. It was a great American company. And Mr. Flannery is going to return it to be a great American company, as he did with health care. But I think if you don't speak out formally about what happened to this company, then you really are a sham. And I refuse to be a sham. And I'm proud that Mr. Haynes told me that I don't give free passes to people. There's no free pass. Mr. Rimmel did some bad things here. Uh, David, uh, in terms of the street reaction today, uh, a couple of quotes. Morgan Stanley, healthy, healthy dose of realism for the Bulls. Uh, there's a firm called Melius Research got picked up saying the pressure to break this up just went through the roof. Uh, where are you going to be headed today? Yeah, you know, I mean, of course, that, uh, the larger question of what the overall benefit is of this conglomeration of companies is certainly one that a lot of people are asking. Although, as Jim has pointed out many times, it's not clear that you can actually add value necessarily by just wholesale breaking this company apart. Listen, you know, Jim just had strong words. So did Flannery, Jim, on the call itself. I mean, I thought his, his opening remarks were rather remarkable for their both forthright, forthrightness and for just how tough he was. We're driving sweeping change, moving with speed and purpose. Our culture needs to be driven by mutual candor and intense execution. We can and we will and we must improve the cash flow of margins of the company. We will have a simpler, more focused portfolio. Um, on and on, Jim, with very, very strong words. Of course, something you and I have talked about on air now for a week or two, the dividend continues, he says, to be a priority in their capital allocation framework. And they say they understand its importance. It's still unclear how they can continue to maintain that payout ratio given free cash flow doesn't come close to covering it. Do you get that? Mr. ML screwed up. While other companies are doing well, this is now the worst performer in the Dow under his leadership. And he was very closely tied to Barack Obama. I can't overemphasize that. And he's going the opposite way of the rest of the American economy right now. The American economy is growing now faster than it has been growing for the last eight years. But GE is falling apart, and it's because of his leadership, Mr. Melt, who had his close relationship with Barack Obama. If you don't see the correlation, that's odd. I'm going to turn this over to my good friend, Ron Edwards. And as G, think about this, breaking up GE, General Electric, coming apart and no longer be... I'm going to turn this over to Ron Edwards, and we'll be back with Hour 2 of Black Man Thinking. President Trump has directed the United States to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, despite what the Dragon Media and others may proclaim, Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. Hello, I'm Ron Edwards. On today's page from the Edwards Notebook, the city of Jerusalem was first designated Israel's capital over 3,000 years ago by King David, as described in 2 Samuel in the Bible. Following King David, his son Solomon built the Holy Temple and installed the Ark of the Covenant there. Ever since the days of King David, the Jews have faced Jerusalem in their daily prayers. It is the center of Jewish faith and the core of Jewish history, which predates by over a millennium the Islamic persuasion. Jerusalem is where the Knesset governing body is housed, and it doesn't make sense for the United States to maintain its embassy 60 miles away in Tel Aviv. I believe that despite the violent protests and the numerous nations around the world who have denounced President Trump's decision to move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, it will ultimately bode well for both the United States and Israel. After all, Israel is a sovereign nation with the right to choose its capital, and likewise, the U.S. is a sovereign nation with the right to choose where to place our U.S. embassies. God bless both Israel and the United States of America. I'm Ron Edwards. Sponsored by the Tri-County Liberty Coalition. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up. Live out the true meaning of its dreams. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in Black men think and think and Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. 
The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. Black men thinking. Anytime you throw your weight behind a political party that controls two-thirds of the government and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. Black men thinking. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. Black men thinking, thinking. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Black men thinking. Stanley Levy, thinking. Black Man Thinking, here thinking. on the dominant force in internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us. Also, WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5 North Florida Talk Radio. FreedomInAmericaRadio.com and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Welcome to Hour 2 of the show. Let's start by talking about Atlanta. Atlanta is now celebrating what I call the missing man election. Why do I call it that? Well, you had a heated race. At least that's the way they portrayed it in Atlanta. Big deal. A lot at stake in Atlanta. because. At this point, a white person actually had a snowball's chance of being elected mayor in Atlanta. That hadn't happened since the 1970s. So this was a big deal. You had former mayors. You had all the endorsers and everything else coming out. And at the end of it, 33% of the elected of the uh, registered voters turned out to cast a vote. That's why I called a missing man election. Where were the, where, where were the people? The black political class was fully invested, but the residents were not. Well, you know, voter apathy is a problem throughout America. No, you're not, you're, not, you're not getting this. This was not a national election where you can't touch the president. It wasn't a federal election where, you know, your congressional guy is, well, I don't know, I can't. I, this was municipality where you can go down to City Hall and see the person who's going to be responsible for government. That's what it was. They don't have to come back home so that you can see them. They have to govern in the city. So they're right there. Two out of three people in Atlanta said, I don't give a rip who the mayor is. I don't care. And since you split up that that remaining third, only one in six Registered voters in Atlanta selected the mayor. Of course, they want to call this black girl magic. Black girl magic is one out of six voters. Really? Okay. So here's the real takeaway from the election in Atlanta. Blacks have given up on Atlanta and its black leadership. That's the problem. They don't care about it because it doesn't care about them. Listen to Keisha Lance Bottoms, the new mayor-elect, pending any recount that may occur. Here she is on Fox 5 affiliate in Atlanta the day after the election. Now joining us live to talk more about the election results and the road ahead is Keisha Lance Bottoms. First of all, congratulations to you and thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, uh, we, last time you were here, we talked about it. How much have you slept? And I'm guessing it's almost none. Uh, one hour. Yeah, so one hour. that's probably better than last time. You did pretty well. You do pretty well on one hour one hour sleep. Are you getting used to seeing yourself claiming victory there? And also, are you surprised at how close this was? 
Now, I, we knew it would be close. Um, I, I didn't know it would be this close, mm -hmm. but I knew it would be close. And I knew that every single vote would matter. So I'm just grateful that people got out and voted yesterday, especially in the rain. Um, that was concerning to me. But people really took this election very seriously. And we see that every single vote matters. And I guess there are some military and some absentee uh, votes that are still to be counted. Mary Norwood's asking for a recount. Are you concerned at all about that? And also, what do you do between now and the time of the recount? So after I sleep at some point <laughs> yeah, well, today, they will start more, focusing yeah. <laughs> on the transition. And um, as it relates to the recount, there was a recount in 2009, mm -hmm. and it didn't make a difference. We recently had a recount in one of the city, um, city council races, and it didn't change the outcome. So I don't expect that there will be any change. It was so close. We knew it would be close all along. I don't know if we knew it would be this close, but this is similar to the one you just mentioned uh, eight years ago as far as the closeness. What do you think it was that set you apart or kind of put you over the top there? I think that people really started to listen to our messages and they really started to pay attention to us as candidates and at some point people really I think began to um, just filter out all of the noise as it related to other people and, and other issues that really weren't pertinent to this race. So we've always focused directly on the voters and not on endorsements which were are helpful but I knew at the end of the day endorsements don't determine elections, mm -hmm. voters determine elections. So if these numbers hold up, in your mind, does that say that this city is divided? And if that is the case, pretty evenly divided, what do you do to unify it? No, absolutely not. I think what it says is that people care about the city. And what I've found is um, we've been out all over the city. People care about the same things, whether it's north, south, east, or west. We're all talking about the same issues, affordability and equity, criminal justice reform, traffic, education. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, uh, people understand that there will be a winner, there will be a loser. And Atlanta is one city, and it's just about moving forward and making sure we're working all in the same direction. All right. Well, congratulations, Stu. We appreciate you coming in today and hope you get a little bit of rest today. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Let me see if I get this straight. People really cared, and they came out even though the rain. It was really, you know, people really cared. Two out of three registered voters did not bother to vote. Stop lying. Stop lying. The voters really cared. They stopped. They tuned out the noise. No. The, to two out of three of them, the election was noise. What part of that did you miss? The question is, why do Atlantans believe so little in black leadership? Well, they, they kept, no, excuse me, when you can't get people to come out to vote, they don't care. And when they split the vote between a white woman and a black woman, they really don't care. One's as good as another, because neither one of them are doing a doggone thing for the city. Why do they say that? Let's talk about the black folks. Compared to when Maynard Jackson, who was a great political leader, transformative in my mind. I lived in Atlanta during my formative years while he was the mayor. The city's become a cesspool since then. And the black political class has just been profiling and raping the city like a bunch of, as Jackson once described them, shuffling, grinning Negroes. So how, to how out of touch are these folks in Atlanta who run it? They're celebrating a city election in which nearly 7 out of 10 folks stayed home. And the only campaign issues, the only real campaign issues were, well, we're going to keep a black mayor, right? And issue 1A was, Oh, we got to keep a Democrat, right? There's some real issues going on in Atlanta. The skin tone of the mayor ain't going gonna, ain't gonna to affect that. There's some real issues in, it, Matt, in Atlanta. The political affiliation of the mayor ain't really going to fix that one way or the other. How out of touch are these folks in Atlanta? Upwardly mobile blacks are getting the heck out of Dodge. And they're leaving Atlanta with an increasing percentage of the population that are problem children. All kinds of issues. But since they're leaving, that means the city doesn't necessarily have the same resources to deal with it. Here's one of the problems there that I didn't hear anybody really talk about while they were worried about who was going to win the Atlanta election. Let's talk about abandoned homes. Residents in one southwest Atlanta neighborhood say abandoned homes in their community pose a danger to children. Channel 2's Audrey Washington spoke with people on Fair Street in the Ashview Heights neighborhood and got a close-up look at the problem near two neighborhood schools. 
Some are boarded up, others left charred and gutted. Either way, residents say these abandoned homes on Fair Street have to go. I think that it is deplorable. Garnet Davis lives next door to this home and watched it burn last July. Since then, he says nothing has been done to either renovate it or tear it down. Build something else. I mean, I mean, it's a prime neighborhood. We're close to downtown. Only. Many of the residents tell me they're mainly concerned about the children in this area. If you look here behind me, you can see there's an elementary school just steps away from an unsecured abandoned home. I don't want the children to play around the abandoned properties. Right across the street sits 986 Fair Street. Some of the windows are secured, but there's no front door. Neighbors tell me because it's getting colder, squatters have broken inside and have even lit fires to stay warm. They go in and they do their drugs and, you know, they sleep there. I called code enforcement. They told me 986 Fair Street is in the inspection process and that officials determined it to be in violation. They are still trying to make contact with the owner. Some residents say it all comes down to changing how properties are registered. That legislation changes for code enforcement, that the price is not 175 bucks. It needs to be at least $1,000. It should not be easy to register an abandoned property. Davis says while things are figured out, he'll make sure to keep his children away from the houses and the people who frequent them. In southwest Atlanta, Audrey Washington, Channel 2 Action News. That was from May of 2000, excuse me, December of 2015. What's that got to do with the election now? Well, southwest Atlanta is where Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor-elect, has been representing the city. She was elected to the city council in 2010. She's been there ever since. Until now, now she's going to be mayor. Still got that same problem there. She had already been there for five years, and they're still and they're reporting on it. What has she done? Well, uh, we had the Invest in Southwest initiative that she started. I believe that was started in the same year that report was, was filed in 2015. And we still got problems in Southwest Atlanta. We still got boarded up homes. We still got abandoned homes, boarded up businesses. But now you made her mayor because she's black. Don't lie to me and tell me that she is mayor for any other reason. You cannot point to what she has accomplished. You cannot even point to what her campaign strategies were, except to make sure y'all keep Atlanta black and let's have some, make sure we got a Democrat up in here. Here's another thing. I don't remember hearing about this, and I followed the election. I remember hearing about this during the campaign. This is from May of last year, talking about a big deal in Atlanta. A deadly disease is rampant across the metro area, and scientists are calling it an epidemic. Channel 2's Dave Huddleston met with doctors who are now comparing parts of the metro area to third world countries. That's exactly right. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention statistics suggest 1 in 51 Georgians will be diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. And Atlanta is the epicenter of the southern epidemic. J.R. Watson has AIDS. He says he contracted it from a woman he was dating. I sat there and I literally cried like a baby for 30 or 45 minutes. And all it took was that one time with that wrong person to change your life forever. A life that requires dozens of pills daily. So many he uses a tackle box to store them. He shares his story so everyone understands AIDS can hit anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. Just because you live in a nice neighborhood, you live outside of Atlanta. But if you live in the capital city, AIDS research officials say the number of people affected is staggering. Downtown Atlanta is as bad as uh, Zimbabwe or Harare or, you know, or, or Durban. Emory's Dr. Carlos Del Rio compares Atlanta's AIDS problem to third world countries. How did it get this bad? He says the disease now affects just about every population, but in particular, African Americans with limited access to health care. Don't have food on your table, have kids to take care of, and somebody says you have HIV, that's just another, that's just another problem that you have. Another problem, a lack of leadership and mismanagement. In this audit of Fulton County's HIV prevention program, it cites poor management and the staff's inability to use millions of free dollars given to them by the CDC to educate and serve high-risk HIV communities. Well, it certainly was a bruise eye. After learning of the problems, Fulton County Chairman John Eves demanded new leadership. I did meet with CD officials directly and assured them that processes were in place to make sure going forward, monies would be better accounted for. Here's why that's critical. 
The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says if you live in the southeast, you're more likely to be diagnosed with HIV than any other part of the country. In Georgia, the risk of diagnosis leaps to 1 in 51. We should not be having an epidemic of that proportion in a country like ours. But we are. Fulton County now has a new public health director. And this is the part where the fingerprint comes in, okay? It's now steering its mobile HIV testing unit into hot zones, zip codes with the highest number of HIV cases. The day we were with them downtown near Grady Hospital, they tested more than 30 people. Two came back HIV positive. HIV has not abated. It has not gone anywhere. Yes, yep. But fortunately for Watson and others with AIDS, it is no longer an automatic death sentence if you receive treatment. Watson also found love and is now married. I fall in love with her more every day. And that's no lie. That's no exaggeration. Fulton County officials told me they now have a new health department director. And they also said they are working with an HIV task force on new programs to educate Georgians, get folks in low-income communities tested, and more importantly, keep those who test positive in treatment. Third world countries, that's what they're talking about, the infection rate, HIV infection rate in Atlanta. You know what Keisha Lance Bottoms said on her campaign website about that? Nothing. Here are the things that she said. She had an all-rise program. This is what it's going to do. Make our neighborhoods safer. Tackle our traffic and transit problems. Address our housing affordability challenges. Create good-paying jobs for Atlantans. Support our LGBTQ community. Support our students and families. Now, there are bullet points underneath that. I guess the one for AIDS would be under LGBTQ. Well, what does that say? Ensure their voices are heard within my administration. Being a more present and accountable face regarding the HIV uh, crisis, we need to create an office dedicated to the HIV issue. Since we lacked a court, you've been, since we lacked a coordinated effort or response, you've been on the city council since 2010. What's the problem? You didn't care. You don't care. The only reason you bring it up is to sit there and try to make sure that you get you get elected. And once you get elected, this is not going to stop. It hasn't stopped. It hasn't stopped for all this time. You had eight years or so of Kasim Reed, and it got this way. You had it before. It didn't pop up overnight. This has been going on for nearly a decade. Understand this very clearly. Very clearly. Black political class in Atlanta is out of touch. It's period. That's all it is. What about education? You know, we went from the majority to minority busing program in the 70s, which improved education, the quality of that for black children. I was one of those people whose education quality was improved to a cheating scandal that put educators behind bars and demonstrated quite clearly that Atlanta didn't give a rat's behind about black kids. And remember, the superintendent of schools in Atlanta during that time was a black woman. The teachers got put behind bars, black teachers. How out of folk, how out of touch are these black political class folks in Atlanta? They're forming new municipalities to separate their money and their values from Atlanta, from that progressive ratchetness that that produces blight and disease. That's why two out of three people in Atlanta didn't show up to vote. That's why the problems continue, because black Atlantans, as well as the rest of the city, know that you're not going to get any help from government. So why bother to invest your time in it? Nevertheless, the black political class is jumping up and down, screaming black girl magic, and look what we did. Yeah, I've looked around the city. I see exactly what you've done. You're destroying what was a great place for the black family in Atlanta, and you've turned it to a place where the black family needs to be. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking. We'll be back right after. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force in Internet Conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us. Also, WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5 North Florida Talk Radio. Freedom 
in AmericaRadio.com and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Well, the Senate race in Alabama is going to wrap up this week. On Tuesday, the votes will finally be cast. During this entire time, since the primary, there have been accusers of the Republican candidate, which is Judge Roy Moore, who used to be, I believe, the judge of the and the chief justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. Um, eight women, I believe, have come out and said that he has acted inappropriately with them. Now, all of these accusations are from decades ago. All of them center around the judge's um, apparent fascination with younger women. His wife is 14 years younger than he. They've been married for more than three decades, and there has been no allegation of any inappropriate behavior since he's been married. Now, the interesting thing about these allegations is, well, there's no proof. There's an allegation, and there's emotion, and we have this Me Too, hashtag Me Too phenomenon going on, so, of course, All that's going on. Let me tell you, give a little background on this and why this matters. People may remember that in the Republican primary, there was a gentleman called Luther Strange who was on the ticket as well. Donald Trump threw his support behind Luther Strange. Let me tell you why Donald Trump is a genius. Trump trapped Mitch McConnell by supporting Luther Strange. I don't know if Donald Trump knew Anything about Luther Strange? I do believe Donald Trump is savvy enough and his people are savvy enough to know about the past of Roy Moore. And I think that's why he didn't support him. But I think the primary reason was a Mitch McConnell thing. Because if no matter what happens, Mitch McConnell can't win against Donald Trump if if, if, uh, Trump supported Strange. If Strange did not prevail, then you can't say Donald Trump had anything to do with it. And if Strange does prevail, then Mitch McConnell cannot say that Donald Trump is not in his corner. Either way, Mitch McConnell was done. And, of course, when Strange lost, Trump was free to do whatever he wanted. And he has now, at the uh, 11th hour, it seems almost, come out in support of Judge Roy Moore. But the big deal right now is one of the main accusers of Judge Roy Moore, who said that he had sexually assaulted her or something like that back in 1977 has run into a bit of a problem with her credibility. Fox News reported it this way on December 8th. Yeah, that accuser is Beverly Young Nelson. She appeared on uh, today's installment of ABC's Good Morning America. Uh, She tells GMA that she added her own handwriting, some handwritten notes below what she claims was Roy Moore's signature. Those notes include the numbers 122277 and a date and Old Hickory House. Uh, These represent both the date and restaurant where and when she says that Roy Moore signed her high school yearbook. Nelson told ABC the rest of the yearbook entry, though, is Roy Moore's handwriting, but at her initial news conference with attorney Gloria Allred back in November, Nelson made no mention of adding her own handwriting to the yearbook entry. Nelson accuses Moore uh, of assaulting her after she accepted his offer for a ride home from the restaurant where she worked back when she was 16. Moore denies the allegations, and on Twitter, he points to this latest development in, in the news as further evidence that his accuser, quote, lied. I'm going to add in something here. Let me get this straight. So this happened in 1977. She says she was assaulted. Uh, She doesn't say that it was, that it occurred in December of 1977. At least I haven't heard that. My question is this. The entry in the book that they say was Judge Roy Moore's handwriting said something about Merry Christmas. So obviously we, Seems like we're probably in December. Let's assume, because I don't know to the contrary, that the alleged sexual assault occurred prior to the end of the year, prior to the month of December. If somebody actually sexually assaulted you, are you going to have them sign your yearbook? Okay. Over on CNN, because CNN is good at this, they dealt with this as well and did their best to try to make sure that we understood 
that this really doesn't change anything about the allegations against Roy Moore. Uh, I do want to get to some brand new comments now from a Roy Moore accuser. Beverly Young Nelson, you've heard her name. She, she's the one who's accused uh, Roy Moore of sexual assault. Uh, well, today she admits altering the yearbook entry that she's been offering as proof of Moore's interest in her when she was merely a teenager. Uh, the yearbook note with the signature, uh, Nelson says, is Moore's, reads... Uh, in cursive there, it reads, To a sweeter, more beautiful girl, I could not say Merry Christmas. Christmas 1977, love Roy Moore, DA, District Attorney, uh, the date 12-22-77, on location Old Hickory House. Now, Nelson now is coming forward and saying the date and the restaurant notes are hers, not Roy Moore's. Uh, Nelson's attorney, Gloria Allred, has insisted that from the beginning that the entire entry was written by Roy Moore, after this admission by Beverly Nelson today, Allred uh, held this news conference stressing that her client stands by her story that Moore attacked Nelson when she was just 16 years of age. And Gloria Allred also said today she announced that she had a handwriting expert look at the yearbook. Here they were. The expert concluded that the signature and the handwritten notation above the signature on Exhibits 1 and 2 were prepared by Roy Moore. We are very happy to be able to announce this important expert opinion regarding Beverly's yearbook. We think it's important evidence that supports Beverly's statements that Roy Moore asked to sign her yearbook when she was just 16 years old. And it demonstrates that when Roy Moore stated, quote, I do not know any of these women, end quote, that statement does not appear to be true. Because according to forensic handwriting and document examiner Arthur T. Anthony, the signature and the handwritten notation above the signature were prepared by Roy Moore. We did not ask the expert to examine the printing after the cursive writing and signature because Beverly indicates that she added that to remind herself of who Roy Moore was and where and when Mr. Moore signed her yearbook. Let's, uh, let's start there. I have with me CNN Chief Political Analyst Gloria Borger and John Hammontree, Managing Producer for Reckon by AL.com. He's also on the editorial board of AL.com. So great to have both of you on. And just, just straight to Alabama, John, I want to go straight to you because, it, you know, from listening to the bits and pieces of this news conference, it's my understanding, even though she's saying, yes, uh, you know, Beverly Nelson just had added the date and the location to remind herself who this Roy Moore was, the, the heart of her story is not changing. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's correct, and I think it's not out of line, actually, with the claims that were made by Roy Moore's campaign uh, in a press conference on November 15th. Uh, his attorney, Philip Draghi, what he came forward and said is not that nothing on the page was written by Roy Moore, but that it didn't look like everything on the page was written by Roy Moore, and I think this would be consistent with that claim. Um, you know, you, you could make a very strong argument that they should have disclosed this in their original press conference, uh, but I don't think that this puts uh, anything inconsistent with what uh, they said earlier, or with what the Moore campaign itself has said. But even though her story is not changing, Gloria Borger, you know this is the kind of thing that in these final, what, four days before, you know, Tuesday, the Roy Moore campaign is going to take this little piece, this little nugget, and run with it. Sure, if they want to talk about it uh, and, and raise the issue again. So we'll have to see whether they want to do that. And if, and if they want to raise the issue of her, yeah, they'll say that because they'll say, well, you can't believe anything. I, I agree that they should have just raised it at the outset, say she put in the date and the place and, and the rest of it and the rest of it was his. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the campaign that that Moore is running now is, uh, you know, very much against uh, Doug Jones, the liberal and, you know, who's going to vote, who's who's going to vote with the liberal Democrats and who's going to be. Uh, you know, uh, wrong on abortion and wrong on all the issues. And so the question that I would have is whether the campaign would want to reopen this can of worms right now. They mm -hmm. might. They might. But they might also just decide to uh, to stick with uh, Donald Trump all the way and, and ride him to their victory if, you know, because that might be the easier way. It really doesn't have anything to do with being easier. It's really a matter of, you know what, they're lying. Because remember... Allred didn't say anything about this before when she trotted the yearbook out there. She didn't say anything about, oh, well, you know, was all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. Oh, so all this isn't here? All this isn't him? He didn't, he, he didn't, he didn't write all that. Oh, okay. So what did you write? And how come you didn't? And why are you writing this? What are you doing? Okay. This all is just 
hilarious to me, to be honest with you. It's, it's sad, sadly hilarious. And that's one of the women that has said something against Roy Moore. There's another one. In a report back on the 28th of November, One American News found this out about a Roy Moore accuser. As Alabama Senate candidate Judge Roy Moore continues to face scrutiny for sexual misconduct allegations, court documents reveal one of his accusers may have a violent past. One America's Stephanie Myers has more. After Roy Moore won the Republican primary for Alabama's vacant Senate seat for the U.S. Senate, many women have come forward claiming he acted inappropriately toward them in the past. And as time goes by, many are uncovering the skeletons in their own closets, raising questions about their potential motives. A recently released Breitbart report reveals one of the accusers, Tina Johnson, was involved in a custody case back in 1991 with her mother over Johnson's then 12-year-old son. But it's important to note that it was Judge Moore who represented her mother, Mary Cofield, in the custody battle. During the trial, Cofield described Johnson as an unfit and unstable mother and accused her of taking her son from his elementary school against his will. Ultimately, Cofield, Moore's client, was awarded custody in the case. In addition, an affidavit signed by Cofield alleged Johnson of having a quote-unquote violent nature. The custody battle and affidavit aren't the only thorns plaguing Johnson's past. Documents from 2010 show Johnson pleaded guilty to writing bad checks and for third-degree theft of property. Earlier this month, Johnson alleged Moore grabbed her from behind while she was in his law office during the time of the custody battle in 1991. Many find it suspicious that Johnson is coming forward about the allegations against Moore, noting how her claims could be revenge from when Moore represented her mother in the custody battle. Despite the allegations against Judge Moore, his wife Kayla put on a Women for Moore event earlier this month, highlighting their experiences working with Moore and emphasizing how he always acted appropriately. I have been in multiple political professional settings, mostly related to gun rights and Republican politics with Roy Moore and his wife Kayla, and I can say that nothing but godly Christian character and respectable attitude came from them. I feel absolutely 100% confident that he's the man to send to our U.S. Senate that will protect my right to protect myself from the type of creeps that he's being accused of being. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey has also come out in support of Moore, noting the repercussions that will happen if Moore is not elected to the U.S. Senate representing Alabama. Most important, we need to have... Um, a Republican in the United States Senate to vote on the things like Supreme Court justices, uh, other appointments that the Senate has to confirm and make major decisions. And so uh, that's, that's what I plan to do is vote for uh, the Republican nominee, Roy Moore. Stephanie Myers, One America News. So let me get this straight. We have eight women who've come out against Roy Moore. One of them has messed up her story by not telling people that she was doctoring the yearbook entry that she was using to demonstrate that Roy Moore even knew who she was, as though because see, I signed something 40 years ago, I'm supposed to remember. Oh, okay, fine, got it. And now we find out that she's uh, trying to enhance her story, which makes her look not credible. Add that to the fact there's no proof of her allegation. And then we have a second different woman who's coming out against Roy Moore saying he grabbed her and let me see, Roy Moore proved in court to a judge's satisfaction that she was an unfit mother, taking her child from her and giving her to that woman's mother. Wow. Also, bad checks, other criminal activity. Amazing. But Roy Moore is being accused by her of some... Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then, of course, you have a a bunch of women who actually do interact with Roy Moore it, within the last 40 years who come out with his wife and demonstrate that, hey, we don't have a problem with Roy Moore. All we've ever seen from Roy Moore is appropriate behavior. And you have the governor of Alabama, a woman, saying, we need a Republican. I'm voting for Roy Moore. These folks are lying. And they've always been lying. Because this is what Democrats 
and particularly progressive Democrats, have been doing since 1990. To my recollection, they went after Clarence Thomas. They went after Herman Cain. They've gone after a number of people. The interesting thing is, everyone who stands up to them seems to prevail. Roy Moore is standing up to them. He's not being run out of town like Herman Cain was, for example. Tuesday's going to be interesting. I think Roy Moore will prevail. And if he does, that means serious problems, more serious problems for the Democrats in the Senate. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, will be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force in Internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us, also WBDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia, WJHC, Talk 107.5 North Florida Talk Radio, FreedomInAmericaRadio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Final segment of the show. Um, This past week we saw John Conyers announce his retirement, and I put that in air quotes, from Congress, and Al Franken announced his resignation from the Senate. The interesting thing is, both these men being Democrats, is how is this really being played out? Because remember, we had the thing on Roy Moore, talked about that earlier, which included the snowflake behavior of Paul Ryan, which I did not get into, and his Issue was saying it doesn't matter what the poll says. He thinks that Roy Moore should not be running, which I find interesting because Paul Ryan doesn't represent the state of Alabama and he's not even talking about the same legislative chamber. It is in two ways minimum none of your business. It just isn't. But when we talk about what's happening with John Conyers, let's start with Conyers. This is how... Roland Martin, who, thank goodness, his show is being yanked later this month, he talked about this in this regard on the 5th of December. All right, folks, some breaking news out of Detroit. Several news reports, including the New York Times, are reporting that uh, Congressman John Conyers is going to retire, not resign, going to retire. Later this morning, about a couple of hours, he's going to be talking to Radio 1's Mildred Gaddis at 1015 Eastern, where he will explain his decision. That his nephew has told the New York Times that he is going to retire when his term is up in 2018 due to health reasons. Uh, Shelly, go to my iPad. This is the front page right now of the Detroit Free Press. that says, report Conyers to retire, not resign. On the phone is Rochelle Riley, a columnist with the Detroit Free Press. Uh, Rochelle, do you think that this will be good enough to satisfy uh, Conyers' critics? It, it will be good enough for the time being, but I can tell you the Democratic Party has created another problem for itself in the long run because, of course, uh, at a rally for Conyers that was attended by more than 200 people and in questions being asked by people across the country, why would Nancy Pelosi, after this let's stand by him until he gets due process on Meet the Press Sunday, then do an about face and say he should resign, but not also call for the same for Al Franken and Donald Trump. So there is some consternation among folks that this has racial implications, that this does not, uh, some women are more important than others. So, so it, it won't end the saga, but it will end uh, the, the the, the calls for him to step down, step away, and do something. Well, no, Anthony, President of Detroit NAACP, you, of course, were speaking at that rally yesterday. Your thoughts now on this news? Well, Roland, I, I, I kind of agree with Rochelle relative to that. You must have had something in your serious one in the way you've been talking about it. <laughs> but I would simply say, I would simply say that, uh, and it's important to remember, too, that as we talk about John Conyers, and I don't want to preempt what he may or may not say relative to the Mildred Gaddis show, but we're simply saying that it is the right of the people who elected him uh, to really have the impact upon which, what future he has. If he decides to exit and not run again, that's his decision. There's a lot of unnecessary pain and stress that has been put upon him by those who are in leadership who have seemingly turned against him and not given him due process. That's all we're called for. Gotcha. It's unfortunate, Roland, that the Democrats, in so, so many cases, don't have no spine and Republicans don't have no heart. They will gut you. 
uh, when it comes to you, and the Democrats will not stand with you. All That's right. what needs to change. All right. So we'll wait to see what the Congress of me has to say. Well, no, Anthony, Rochelle Riley, we appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Uh, again, folks, we'll have the news of John Carnes, Congressman John Carnes, what he has to say to Mr. Gaddis tomorrow on TV One's News One Now. Did you notice how the party of women seems to have no regard for the women who John Conyers has been inappropriate with for decades? It's well known. Koki Roberts even came out and said, you know, it was well known. Don't get in an elevator alone with John Conyers. Don't go to his office alone. Don't do that because he his stuff was known. But the other thing, interesting thing is, uh, and I played that because I needed – to make sure you understood the perspective of the black political class. They don't give a rat's behind about what their quote-unquote icons do. They basically care that their icons are being treated differently, so they think, with regard to anyone else. It doesn't matter that what they did was wrong. It doesn't matter at all. Now, in the case of Kyle, well, how are you saying you don't believe the things against Roy? There's no proof that Roy Moore did anything. There's no proof that Donald Trump did They allege things against him. Donald Trump hasn't paid people to make cases go away. Donald Trump fights these things. He fights them. And then they go away. They get dismissed. John Conyers paid folks off. Roy Moore is fighting because there's no proof. And you keep finding out things about his accusers to let you know these folks ain't credible. I noticed, notice what he said. Oh, John Conyers is, is, is retiring. He's not resigning. Okay, that was on the 5th of December. On the 9th of December, NBC News had this report regarding John Conyers. After weeks of pressure, a flood of sexual harassment accusations, and escalating calls from top Democrats to resign his seat, Congressman John Conyers had nowhere left to go. I am retiring today. Calling in to a Detroit radio show from the hospital where he's being treated for stress, Conyers still denying he harassed anyone. They are not accurate. Or they're not true. His lawyer insisting he's leaving for health reasons. Conyers endorsing his son, John Conyers III, to replace him. But the allegations keep coming. This week, Eliza Grubbs accusing Conyers of groping her while they sat in church together. Her cousin, Marion Brown, broke a non-disclosure agreement to tell her own story on Today. He pointed uh, to areas of genital areas of, of his uh, body and asked me to, uh, you know, touch it. First elected in 1964, Conyers is the longest-serving member of the House. Considered a civil rights icon, he worked with Martin Luther King and co-founded the Congressional Black Caucus, the Me Too movement echoing through the halls of Congress. Republican Congressman Blake Farenthold announcing he'll pay back $84,000 in taxpayer money he used to settle a harassment case. I didn't do anything wrong, but I also don't want the taxpayers to be on the hook for this. Congress now grappling with how to fix a system critics say protects the people who built it. We have people with extraordinary power who tend to not believe that normal rules apply to them. John Conyers is a dirty old man. Um, I like the part where they try to throw in a Republican. They always want to throw in a Republican. Uh, Republicans are this and that and the other, and I understand that. Uh, that's just part of the bias, because if this were... A couple. If this were about a long-standing uh, Republican congressman leaving, we wouldn't hear about it. But notice he says he's retiring. That's the same thing that um, Roland Martin said. Now I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because that those reports are four days apart. However, NBC News did give you this on the 9th of December as well, as long as that wrong with that report. After John Conyers retires, his congressional seat will remain vacant for 11 months. Stop. He's not going to leave at the end of the congressional term. They're saying he's going to leave now. Michigan's Republican governor announced Friday that Democrat John Conyers' seat will not be filled until the regularly scheduled November election, leaving it vacant for nearly a year. So if you're getting out now anyway, please explain to me the difference between retirement and resignation. It is a distinction without a difference. You're out. You're not involved. You're not a lawmaker anymore. And the people are not even going to be represented in that district any longer. Governor Rick Snyder decided the post will be listed twice on the August primary and November general election ballots. While unlikely, it is possible the voters could choose one candidate to fill the vacancy 
until January 2019 and elect another to a full two-year term after that. I find this fascinating. Fascinating. Here's the interesting thing. The 88-year-old Conyers, who was facing a House Ethics Committee investigation over claims by former staffers, cited health reasons for his resignation Tuesday. Remember, he, he retired, though. Snyder's office said it consulted with Wayne County leaders before making a decision. The 13th Congressional District Democratic Party organization backed the decision, too. So for everyone who wants to cry racism and say, how, how can you leave these people without congressional registra- reg- uh, representation for all this time? The 13th Congressional District in Michigan, that Democratic Party organization backed the decision to leave the seat open for 11 months. I don't even care why, because it doesn't matter. Here's another interesting thing. John Conyers has been on record saying he wants his son to succeed him. Oh, really? That's what he wants, huh? New York Daily News, December 7th. Son of disgraced Democrat John Conyers accused but not charged of stabbing, body slamming girlfriend. Wow. Wow. So you're going to go from somebody who just asks people to, to touch their private parts to someone who actually physically accosts women, and that is your idea of a succession plan. Really? Interesting. Interesting. John Conyers III, a Detroit hedge fund manager, possibly contending for his father's vacant congressional seat, was cuffed at a Los Angeles residence on the, on the back in February, according to case paperwork. His girlfriend, not identified in the paperwork, called the cops after her 27-year-old uh, Bo grew violent and accused her of cheating on him. The girlfriend says Conyers body slammed her on the bed and then on the floor where he pinned her down and spit on her. Yeah, that's that that sounds like a um excellent qualification for you to go into the Congress. Oh wow. Let's move on to Al Franken. Al Franken resigned on the seventh after the good Conyers did He gave a speech to announce his resignation. Here's part of that. Serving in the United States Senate has been the great honor of my life. I know in my heart that nothing I have done as a senator, nothing, has brought this honor on on this institution. And I am confident that the Ethics Committee would agree. Nevertheless, today I am announcing that in the coming weeks, I will be resigning as a member of the United States Senate. I, of all people, am aware that there is some irony in the fact that I am leaving while a man who has bragged on tape about his history of sexual assault sits in the Oval Office, and a man who has repeatedly preyed on young girls' campaigns for the Senate with with the full support of his party. But this decision is not about me. It's about the people of Minnesota. And it's become clear that I can't both pursue the Ethics Committee process and at the same time remain an effective senator for them. Let me be clear. I may be resigning my seat, but I am not giving up my voice. I will continue to stand up for the things I believe in as a citizen and as an activist. Please explain to me why I should care about what he does as a private citizen activist. He's already been, he has admitted to what has gone on. And let me get this straight. Well, I I can't be an effective citizen. Did Bob Menendez give up his seat while he was on trial? I don't know. The idea that if you did nothing wrong and all you're doing is cooperating with a, how, uh, with with an ethics committee investigation why is that going to keep you from casting a vote every now and again? Because that's really all your job is, to vote. It'd be nice if you knew what you were voting for, but if you've been paying attention to Al Franken any at all while he's been in the Senate, the man's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. He has no idea what he's doing. And if you remember how we got into the Senate in the first place, his margin of victory was less than the number of convicted felons who voted in the election and it is illegal for a felon to vote in the state of Minnesota but they did and enough of them voted 
ostensibly to make Al Franken a senator because I guarantee you convicted felons vote Democrat. What does all this mean? Now, the um, the accusers of Al Franken were not satisfied with the speech. They didn't think he gave any um, credence to anything they said, even after he had admitted and even apologized to Leanne Tweeden, who went on CNN last month and just spilled her guts about him. Um, not to mention there was the picture of him actually groping her while she was asleep and him with a big grin on his face having to look back at the cameras to make sure they saw him. Interesting. They're not satisfied. One of them even said, you know, it's time for us to finally um, recognize that we brought this on ourselves by letting Bill Clinton get away. So they're going to, is someone going to actually start beating that drum? I doubt it. What are we looking at here, to be honest? John Conyers is gone. Al Franken is gone. Roy Moore's not going anywhere because Roy Moore's not going to sit there and play the Me Too game because he's not guilty of anything. Donald Trump, you know what? You better bring proof if you're going to go after Donald Trump. Donald Trump doesn't play that. He doesn't play the, oh, I'm being, I'm being accused, therefore I'll quit. John Conyers didn't quit because of his poor health. Don, John Conyers is nearly 90 years old, broke down, and people just lost confidence in him inside D.C. The fact that the Democrats in Michigan would rather leave the seat vacant than replace him tells you all you need to know about the black political class in America. Because they got to get it together because the last thing they want to do is have an open race where they might not get a Democrat to sit in there. And they would love to have his son sit in there. Doesn't matter how, doesn't matter that he body slammed some girl, pinned her on the floor, spit on her. That's just an accusation. Oh, but you want Roy Moore to leave. Nobody has handcuffed Roy Moore. Somebody did handcuff John Conyers III. But you don't care about that because he is a Democrat. Guys, let me remind you once again what this whole Me Too nonsense is about. We are trying to delegitimize male leadership in this country. That's it. They don't mind who it is as long as we can say that men are bad. And that's what they're trying to do. And they got a couple of scalps this week. They did get another Republican scalp, some uh, Trent Franks, who said he was talking to people about surrogacy and therefore he decided to, to resign from Congress. This whole thing is designed to break down men. That's our show. God bless you. God keep you. Be fair with people. I'm not saying that there aren't women who are being abused. But women lie. Say the same thing all the time. Take it to court or take it to the grave. Prove it. And then let's punish it. Until then, there's nothing to talk about. Hope to see you next week. In the meantime, do take care. You've been listening to Black Man Thinking with your host, Stan Levy. Join Stan midnight to 2 a.m. That's late Monday night into early Tuesday morning. And find him on the web at Black Man Thinking without the G. That's blackmanthinking.com.